my name is Hiro Aragaki. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Negotiation and Dispute Resolution here at UC Ball SF. Uh, this week we will uh, who is the Joanne Wharton Murphy slash classes of 1965 and 1973 professor of law emerita at the Ohio State University Moritz College of the Law. Well, that's a mouthful. Uh, professor Deason's recent scholarly work focuses on judicial mediation combinations of mediation and arbitration and enforcement of mediated settlement agreements. She is a reporter of the Uniform Law Commission's Committee to Monitor Developments in Civil Procedure. Served on the Advisory Committee uh, for the drafting of the Uniform Mediation. She served as a law clerk for Judge Harry Edwards on the U.S. Court of Appeals, the D.C. Circuit, and Justice Paul Blackman on the Supreme Court and as a legal assistant to arbitrator Howard Holtzman at the Iran U.S. Famous Tribunal. So Ellen's talk is entitled, Can Mediators Promote Integrity? And it will examine some of the systemic ways in which white supremacy is kind of embedded in the practice of mediation uh, in the United States with the goal of inspiring uh, some So I think you're going to speak for about 20, 30 minutes or so, and then we'd like to open it up. Uh, I've been told I need to use my outdoor voice. <laughs> I'm going to have to spend 10 seconds. Well, I think we're okay. Um, but I want to, I want to give several people thanks. Um, first to Hiro Aragaki and the Center for Negotiation and Dispute Resolution uh, for inviting me to be part of this colloquium. It really is an honor. Um, that's a, I think that's a better microphone. It's the only microphone. Hey, okay, let me just, there you go. Yeah, so you, you get a little amplification from that. Okay, how about if we move it over like oh, yeah, that? See, yeah, see, yeah. Okay, Sorry. all right. Right, I, I hope someone will signal me if there's a problem somewhere. Um, I also want to thank the American Arbitration Association and the International Center for Dispute Resolution, and they are, have generously co-sponsored uh, this lecture and my visit with the class. And I want to express my special appreciation. I just spent a stimulating hour with the students and Professor Eric and we had a great conversation thanks to all of you um, and fourth thanks to those of you who've turned up in person and virtually I see a few familiar faces that um, make me feel great that's nice um, and while I'm giving thanks I guess I should congratulate the UC Law San Francisco School for your new name and what I assume is in alignment with your values. Um, and so what I'm presenting today is a combination. It's both a recently published paper and a work in progress. And I'm trying to blend the two of them together. So I'm really only going to have time to give you a taste of some of the ideas. Um, but I've put my co-authors names on the title page uh, because they're very much here with me in spirit uh, for our ongoing work. So let me give you a little bit of background. The recent paper I mentioned is one that I co-authored with Sharon Press, a professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. And our current paper is an extension and an um, elaboration of this work. And for that, we've joined with Isabel Gunning at Southwestern Law School and we're digging deeper into the idea of neutrality. So, but in um, mediation embedded assumptions of whiteness, and I wanna emphasize that question mark, um, Sharon and I analyzed and looked at various aspects of the mediation practice um, using the concepts in the book by Leila Sai, Me and White Supremacy. And, um, I think our journey is instructive, how we came to this topic. It grew out of reading and discussing this book with a group of dispute resolution colleagues, and we were stimulated by the horrible murder of George Floyd. 
Um, and these were powerful discussions. They were mostly about our personal journeys, but I think the whole that whole group of uh, people that we discussed this with were a lot of credit for that. What it did was stimulate Sharon and me to extend those ideas from the personal to the professional realm. And that's uh, what led to the article. So I, I want to um, start with a basic concept that really underlies all of our work. And that is a definition of white supremacy. Uh, because I think when people hear that term, the first thing they think of is what I used to think of, which is the KKK marching and the groups with the, the weapons and the slurs and burning crosses. And that's what I thought of as white supremacy. Um, but it's much more subtle than that. And so what I'm referring to, and I think this is a foundation for a lot of the ideas, is that it's, it's the attitude that really is pervasive in America, and also in a lot of the world, that positions the white as the ideal. It's the default frame of reference through which we, it's where we're swimming, it's what we see, um, as a white person at least. Um, and I don't think anyone has said it better than Robin DiAngelo in her book, White Fragility. And so I'm gonna read this quote, which is that white supremacy is more than the idea that whites are superior to people of color. It is the deeper premise that supports this idea. The definition of whites as the norm or the standard for human and people of color as a deviation from that norm. They're different. So this was really an eye opener for me about how pervasive white supremacy really is and how it's just embedded in a lot of the ways we think about things. Now, I wanna stress the question mark in the title of the article um, was, was that we were really asking the question, is white supremacy, is this a problem? in mediation is this treating the white as the norm and the standard for human behavior. Um, and um, we've had a number of presentations where people have suggested that we take out that question mark, that, that they, um, their attitude is this is a problem. And then so the question becomes what to do about it. Um, and just to kind of support that idea, I have a, a, a quote from, um, Hassan Botts. He's an African American man who is also a conflict res res resolution professional. Um, and here's what he said in an interview about his experience with mediation. And I'm going to add in some of my own comments as we go along. He says, the models we would use were always Eurocentric. They weren't reality based. They didn't take other cultural perspectives into consideration. And I would translate like that into in terms of what I was just saying is, in other words, uh, the models assume a white norm. But says, I came to understand that mediation is just another tool of oppression and it's used by the system to meet its needs, especially once the court system is involved. But how does it do this? He says, there is a power imbalance. We go into mediation with the goal of bringing harmony perfection, a balance of honesty. And then as I read it, he's saying, we need to instead focus on really getting out the issues instead of the harmony part. As Dr. Jones, who was, who was a retired professor who taught him uh, oppression theory, as Dr. Jones taught me, cuss and discuss. We don't allow people to truly put their concerns on the table. In other words, not everyone feels that they have a voice and voice being a truly essential element of procedural justice. So I'm not going to uh, talk about the whole article. The students got to read it so uh, they can tell you, but I just want to give a brief summary of um, the topics that Sharon and I discuss in the article. And if you want to follow up some more, we're going to have some questions. So first thing is, I think we think of these as some of the elements that come out of Sayed's book that we then think 
apply to some mediations. And we're not claiming all mediations, but that they can be a problem in mediation. And the first idea is tone policing. And what is that? Um, that's a tendency to avoid paying attention to what someone is saying by cri instead criticizing the way they're saying it, criticizing their tone. Um, so a mediator might say, I can understand you better if you don't interrupt um, and speak so loudly. So it's criticizing the way it's being delivered at, 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 in a way that sort of dampens the message. Um, and we think that this shows up in mediation or can show up through the kinds of rules about communication that mediators are taught to use in their opening statement, speak one at a time, um, no interrupting. Some people will say um, respect. We think that's a more complicated uh, question, but, and also in terms of curtailing expressions of anger. And that's not uniformly an approach produced by all mediators, but there are many who are just really uncomfortable. We'll separate the parties immediately um, if anyone seems to be getting angry. Um, now, of course, there are positive effects to those ground rules. We want, we want the mediator to be able to hear the parties. We want the parties to be able to hear each other. Um, but we worry about this because what it can be doing is limiting the authentic voice of the parties by imposing white norms. And this may be a point to, to pause and say that our frame here is what we are, white mediators, worrying about and thinking about the situation where white mediators are mediating either with two people of color or a white person and a person of color, and specifically because of the way that the, that the uh, Leila Syed's book is framed, we're we'll focusing most often on African-American parties, um, but we're coming at it from the idea of a white mediator. And I think the, the article doesn't probably say that clear enough, clearly enough. Um, but what, what this can do, this tone policing or curtailing anger, can send a message that the white way is the best, that the white mediator knows best. Um, now the, uh, so I'm not going to say any more about that. That's a big topic in itself. White superiority. One way that can show up is by the lack of representation of people of color in leadership roles. And, and that that can reflect an attitude of white superiority that then leads to that lack of diversity. This is absolutely and certainly a problem in the dispute resolution field, um, not only in leadership, but in all aspects of um, mediation. And I would add arbitration as well. Um, we really are, we, we're, we're changing, but we still have the heritage of pale, male, and stale. Um, so let me turn now to the last category. I want to zoom in on this a bit because this is where um, our current work lies based in this idea of colorblindness. So what's that? Um, what does it mean when someone says, I don't notice race, I don't see color? Um, obviously that's not true as a literal matter. Um, it's shorthand. Someone saying, well, I don't treat people differently based on their race. So I'm, you know, colorblind. And this has become an important constitutional principle, I would say, um, tested, but more and more important. And it also sounds not only benign, but valuable, right? Uh, when I first heard about colorblindness, it made me think of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And he hoped for a day when, quote, people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And so you can see colorblindness as a long-term goal, perhaps. <coughs> um, but here's what Leila Syed says about it. Um, she calls it a particularly insidious way for people with white privilege to pretend that their privilege is fictitious. And I think there's two underlying points here. One is that if you don't see color, you don't recognize that you yourself are white. 
And so white's not a color, it's just the norm. It goes back to that idea of white being pervasive. Um, but I think the other thing is that we're not to this point yet as a society where skin color doesn't matter. Um, there are many inequities, um, differences that correlate with race and ethnicity. Um, for one example, differences in treatments in the healthcare system. We know that that has a problem with racial inequities, well documented for black and brown people. Um, add in disparities in housing, inherited wealth, educational opportunities. I think that being blind to these realities is to ignore the lived experience of people of color. And I, and I, and you know, sort of stimulated by the conversation in the classroom, we can expand this beyond color to, to other groups that aren't regarded as the norm of the world. And so I think when one could say, what, what I feel anyway, is that one can't fight racism if we don't even recognize that it exists. And to, so to say, I don't see you as having different skin color than mine is also sort of denying your experience. So that's a real quick primer of the concept, but um, let me turn to the kinds of color blindness that we thought, we think we see in mediation. So Sharon and I in our article discussed four different kinds of colorblindness. Um, there are some that are through individual actions and some through systemic aspects of mediation. I'm just going to quickly identify these and then I'm going to turn to concentrate on neutrality. So these were the labels we use, blindness to life experiences. We think this can uh, result from the tone policing, from the forward looking focus that we often use in mediation where we urge people to think about the future and we can't solve the past and we're not gonna get into the blame game, um, but that can result in a participant feeling they don't have the chance to talk about what's really important to them. Um, and I think it can also leave hidden issues that can either block progress if settlement is your goal or block other kinds of understandings that can come out of mediation. Okay, uh, blindness through racial stereotypes. Here, you know, this could be on the part of the mediator, it could be on the part of another participant in the mediation um, through racist stereotypes. And, and here I wanna acknowledge the tremendous work that Carol Azumi did on implicit bias in mediation when she was a professor here. Um, and how is this linked to blindness? the idea of these stereotypes. Well, if you don't see color, again, it's hard to see racism. And it's even harder to see it if the bias is triggered without some kind of conscious awareness that it's being triggered, um, sort of leaving you with, without the ability to examine it and, and put it. Um, blindness through incorporation of Western cultural assumptions. You can think of things like who should be at the table? We think of individuals and their lawyers instead of the family or the community. Um, what should a negotiation look like? We think of something that's fairly linear and, and direct uh, as opposed to perhaps circular and more implicit. Um, and the idea that the mediator should be someone that no one knows and has no relationship with these parties. Um, we think that you know, these things lead to challenges, particularly for the courts. How do they tailor mediation for a minority population? Um, how do we as mediators tailor mediations between members of different conflict cultures? Um, I know that's just kind of whooshed over the top of that, but I wanna to turn to focus on blindness as coupled with white silence. And that's where we see neutrality. And this is the focus of our current work with, with Isabel Gunning. Um, so definition. First thing is, this is these are the model standards of conduct for mediators that if you've been trained as a mediator, you have surely studied. Um, 
there's no definition for neutrality. Um, impartiality is the word that's used, and it's referred to as freedom from favoritism, bias, or prejudice. Um, but neutrality, nonetheless, even though it's not in our standards, it's required, it's regarded as a foundational concept in mediation. And I want to quote or paraphrase really my colleague Josh Stolberg, who has argued strongly that it's the commitment to neutrality that's the crucial thing, the critical element that allows mediation to be a principle resolution procedure. We're not a judge. We're not in that role. But to be effective and principled, um, the argument is that neutrality is, is absolutely core. Now, I said it's not in the model standards. Not only that, there's really no consensus on what either new, neutrality means, impartiality means, or how they're the same or different. Now, I'm not going to go through this, and I know the print's too small for you to read. Uh, but I put it up here to show you just a selection of different people's ideas about neutrality and impartiality. The main message of this slide is there are a lot of different ways of looking at this. Um, I think one that combines a lot of the classic elements is here from Carol Zumi. Um, and she puts this under the label of neutrality. Some people might separate them out, but no conflict of interest procedural equality, outcome neutrality, lack of bias, prejudice, or favoritism toward any party. It kind of combines a lot of them. Um, take a look here at one that's commonly used, Frankel and Stark. So they would say that impartiality is about the way you treat parties, that you're not biased for or against either one of the parties. In contrast to how you treat the parties, they put neutrality in terms of the outcome of the process. You not only have no stake in it, you're not, um, you're not, you're not in some ways concerned with the outcome, leaving it to the parties, right? So they would draw that distinction. I want to add in here um, a quote from. Um, more of a critic from Whitney Benz um, just last year, year before. Um, she thinks of it as being a substitute for trust. And she thinks it's created by equating, and she would object to these equations, I think. Neutrality means fair process. Fair process means fair outcome. And so that, that for her is why we think we talk about neutrality. She points out that what this leads to is the protection of the status quo. And that's where I, I want to turn um, next, but by way of another definition, which is that of white silence. Um, what's this concept? It may just be born of discomfort, um, but it's really being silent about racism from, for whites, whites being silent. And essentially, I think of it as standing on the sidelines. So Layla Syed refers to it as a way of holding on to one's privilege, white privilege, through inaction. And I think uh, one of her examples, which we think can apply to mediation, is staying silent by not holding those around you accountable for their racist behavior. And so this might be a mediator who through the idea of neutrality is not interfering when one party is exhibiting what, what could be considered as racist behavior, implicit or not. Um, and so I think that you know, here's where one can make the case that given the injustices and the history of racism, it's not enough to simply be not racist. The next step is actually being anti-racist. And here's where we think that things run headlong into the way we think about neutrality and mediation. So with the, with the risk of giving you far too many quotes, let me return to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and we interpret this as really being about white silence. We will have to repent in this generation, and I would add 
and coming generations, um, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling si silence of the good people. And I actually think this also gets to the underlying tension. No one wants to be called a racist because we think of it as being the bad people. Right? But when you think of racism as being just accepting whites as being the norm, it, I think it's possible to see yourself as a good person who nonetheless suffers from that prevailing attitude. Okay. Um, so blindness coupled with white silence. The three of us think that um, neutrality can lead to a form of white, of, of white silence. That is non-intervention in the mediation. Now this is gonna depend a lot on how the mediator thinks of neutrality. We don't know a whole lot about what really, we know about trainings, but we don't know what people really think about in terms of what uh, they think is neutrality means for process or for outcome. And so, you know, this is sort of a generalization, but we think that neutrality in process for some people can mean maintaining equidistant from both parties. You know, and, and it can really mean holding both parties away from you to be strictly neutral. Um, and so if a mediator is favoring, they, you could think that a mediator is favoring one side if they provide information, for example, even if it's information that might be crucial to the party making a fair assessment of an agreement. Um, we also think that, um, you know, we, some of those definitions I put up focus on outcome. Um, and so many of them would say that it's an indifference to the outcome. Now, that may not be the best word, but I think a prevalent idea is that at least a mediator should not be a guardian of a fair outcome, that you have no obligation, certainly to ensure a fair outcome, but where's the line? Where, how much can a mediator do? Now, you know, so this is important neutrality. Um, I'm not gonna give a full-fledged, um, De uh, defense of it, but it does allow parties to trust the mediator and hence trust the process. And it's also been described actually as an antidote to bias. We don't see it that way. So we think that um, the problem with treating both people exactly the same is that it leaves in place the status quo. And that status quo could be power imbalances. It could be underlying assumptions about white supremacy. Um, and if you're defining it as equal treatment, then the mediator would need to ignore the weaker parties' inequalities. And that means that automatically the process favors the stronger person. Now, you know, this lots of times you'll have some people with some strengths and some people with other weaknesses. But this idea really applies when, when the things are weighted in a way that, that gives one person um, an advantage. And it leaves the white narrative as the dominant narrative in a lot of these situations. Now, we tend to envision um, this in sports terms. We always say uneven playing field, race. Um, here's another image from a sports context that may um, emphasize a little more the challenge for an individual. Um, but I also think we need to think about what, you know, we're, we're bound by this uneven playing field idea. We need to start thinking more creatively about the nature of this. And I don't have a perfect metaphor, but one I'd like to explore is the idea of an unbalanced musical ensemble. You know, never mind sports, perhaps the trumpets are sounding familiar themes of white supremacy. And they're so loud that we as white mediators can't hear the rest of the music ensemble. Uh, I don't know if that merit, metaphor has much merit. I, in my mind, it relates to voice. So we go back to a uh, crucial aspect of procedural justice. But I do think we need to start thinking about neutrality without just our pat phrases of unequal paid playing fields. Now, 
I don't have time to mention all the people who have questioned an absolutist form of neutrality. We are certainly not the first to do this. Um, and you did see a critique in the definition there from Ben Wins, the back on the charge. Um, we've other, I, I'll just leave that aside and turn to the basic neutrality questions that we're trying to ask. And notice again, we're starting with questions. Uh, maybe we should do more with answers, but we think at least um, raising awareness might be the first step. So what's neutrality? How can it be a core value and not appear in our ethical code? Is it the same as impartiality? Is it different? People differ. Um, how should we think as a field about these concepts? And, and how, should, how should mediators operationalize them? Not just the phrase, but what should mediators be actually doing uh, to put these um, principles forward? And then that question led us to ask, well, if it's not in those codes, where did the idea of neutrality even come from? And I have asked many, many people this question, and no one has given me an answer. The, the response usually is, um, someone starts telling me why neutrality is so important. Um, and I nod, And um, but as far as the genesis of the idea, no one seems to have noticed. So we've been looking at early labor arbitration mediation as a source, but uh, so far I'd have to say, um, we don't really have a very satisfactory answer as to how, how this came to be one of the core principles of our field. And so then what are the practical consequences of it? We certainly don't know much about how mediators think about neutrality or how they apply the concept. And as one of the students pointed out, that's very difficult research because this is a private process. And so it's, it's hard to study things like this. Um, you can get reporting, but not always as good as observing. Um, but there is research suggesting that, that some mediators anyway equate neutrality and impartiality. Um, and there's other work that suggests that many mediators are really frustrated. They, they don't feel they can be sufficiently neutral they find themselves reacting negatively to one of the parties. They, that feels like a failure to them. And so we think that this is an area that needs more work about what is realistically possible and what standards should mediators be held to. Okay, so then two ways of thinking about this. Is there some way that within the confines of neutrality, and obviously we haven't yet defined it very well, are there ways for working um, toward being anti-racist or making mediation into an anti-racist place for the particular parties? And we're not suggesting this is a goal for all mediations. Um, so, if you're a white mediator like me, working with a person of color, and you don't say anything, the assumption is going to be that this is just going to be like usual, and that topics relating to, say, a racial edge or a racial attitude, that they're not really fair game. They're not going to be part of this conversation. So one thing a mediator might do is signal that the process is just is open, just be as simple as saying, it's OK to talk about this. Um, and we think that pre-mediation conferences with the separate parties might be an ideal way in which to do this, because one person might be OK with it and another might not. Um, and that leads me to the second point, which is that this should be a matter of the party's choice. Right? We should really be thinking of party agency and self-determination here. Um, you know, there's a, it, there may be many people who are experiencing a racial issue that don't want to do that they money and be done. Um, so we think that that's a really important thing. And then we think something that the field doesn't do enough because we don't have enough mediators of various different um, categories, if I can use that bad word, um, is that we think that co-mediation with diverse mediators is a really important thing to develop. 
Now, as a prerequisite to that, of course, you have to have a cadre of diverse mediators, and we're not there yet. And again, I think here's a place where race is not the only limit. Um, that 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 we that we could just put lots and lots of people who feel disadvantaged in into this diversity box. Um, so um, how would that how would that help? Well, for one thing, if you've got two people, you have a diversity of views coming from the mediators by definition. It signals respect for differences um, to the parties, and also. It allows us as mediators to improve our, our practices. You can debrief afterwards with the co-mediator who was allowed to be in the room, who's not outside the confidentiality um, And so we think that this really is a, a, a would be a very helpful step. There's some very interesting research on matching race. So that you might say, okay, if you've got a white party in a an African American party should have the same kind of diversity. We think that that's somewhat problematic in that it can simplify the racial dynamics and cultures. But this research did find that when parties shared race with one of the mediators, either the mediator or one of more than one mediators, it had a positive effect on their sense of self efficacy, their sense that they were speaking effectively, that they'd been heard that they understood each other. Um, and also interesting, their, their belief that the court uh, cared about resolving their dispute. These were court mediations. So big um, uh, positive effect. There's also some worry on the other side. If you are not matched with a mediator, um, it, can, it can lead you to feel not as uh, effective in mediation. So significant barrier here are paucity of mediators of color. Okay, let me turn to that second category quickly of countervailing principles. Um, those ideas that I just mentioned are striving to work within the confines of neutrality. Um, another approach would be to say, can we balance neutrality? Are there other things we should be um, weighing against neutrality? Even They might even be somewhat at odds with neutrality. Um, and they may limit the reach of neutrality. So one thing is to think about equity, equity in outcome, equity in process. We don't use that word really uh, in terms of our mediation practice. What would that look like? And I'm thinking equity as opposed to equality, recognizing that different situations can require or justify different treatments. Um, and how far could that principle go in look, still beginning to work on that? Um, emphasis on agency, self-determination. In our article, we suggest that a strong aversion of self-determination could actually make the mediator's beliefs irrelevant and at their attitudes irrelevant if the parties are truly um, determining all this on their own. Um, and we identify transformative mediation as being an example of a practice that, that does tend to elevate this, and also one that not many people have heard of called inclusive mediation, which comes out of community mediation in, in Baltimore. And they do this in different ways, um, but both are <laughs> interesting. Um, and we think that um, the mediator can't be expected to balance a playing field, to go back to, they can't do that uh, completely. You've got financial disparities. Those aren't just a problem in mediation, litigation, everything else. But perhaps the mediator could work with a party in pre-mediation conference to clarify their goals. Um, thinking here of some level of coaching for their negotiation, even if it's only a form of encouragement. Um, And then, you know, if the point of neutrality is to generate trust in the process, um, is there other, are there other ways to do that? What if we think about trust directly rather than indirectly through neutrality? I don't know what the answer to that is, um, but if neutrality is a means to an end, 
to create trust, how might things change if we focus directly on trust? And, and one thing that, that I have a hope for is that mediators will um, not see these things in formulaic terms, but will try to focus on the relationship and the situation of each individual party with all of their intersectionality and their I was talking with Hero about this earlier, and I, I think that it's actually helping me um, articulate where this might go. It's not going to be easy. Um, and, you know, I think we still have a basic question, which is fundamentally, should we be trying to make mediation be a potential place for anti-racist work? Maybe we should just say, hey, it has its limitations. It's working pretty well. Um, let's not go there. Um, let's not mess with something that, that's effective. Um, and there are lots of hurdles. So what kind of training would be necessary? Certainly more than we have now, which is often an hour or two at the end on uh, implicit bias. Um, if we do think of it as a field that it's potential, what should the individual mediator um, do before they take on the role? How should they consider whether they're up to this kind of engagement and whether they would deliver a, a quality process? Um, I think at a minimum, and this goes back to the training, I think people need an awareness of that ubiquitous nature of white supremacy, um, and they need to think about taking a systematic approach to countering it. Um, what about in a particular dispute? What should the mediator do to figure out the role that would be appropriate in that dispute? Um, and how, you know, how can they discern that consistent mm -hmm. with the person? So I guess I have a question for you, which would be, you think of other questions we should be asking. You have a lot of questions, no answers. Well, but I welcome your comments, questions, and reactions. Yeah. Well, that was um, that, that was so great. And this is what I do here on my little note screen. So, um, I'll follow up with you definitely more. That's a good question. Thank you. Like the people I trust to reflect on. So, one of them is. Uh, The notion of the importance of the mediator as opposed to their stance for the system. Uh, and related to that, uh, the role of you as author and your race needs just to toss a couple of little points out that are related to both of those. So there is the research. That, uh, Outcomes objectively were were uh, fair, maybe. Uh, if there was at least one person who shared the race, or I think that was maybe ethnicity of, of the parties. There is that, right? But then on the other hand, in the world of dispute resolution, uh, there's the research on carbine, where Ian Ayers shows exactly the opposite. That actually people perceive, and here we go to the subjective belief that this is fair versus the objective, which resonates also with Tom Tyler's research, where people can perceive that something is fair procedurally, but actually be disadvantaged. That leads to kind of false consciousness. So the research on the carbine was, if I'm remembering this correctly, that um, in a, a number of studies, People thought uh, that if they were black, they would get, people thought that black people get better prices if there's a black salesperson or the end or the dealer was black, but the opposite turned out to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and this goes back to this question of how do we define uh, the race? And uh, there can be uh, internalized racism or internalized uh, any type of bias that there might be. I think of, uh, his name. <laughs> I think it was a somewhat famous person I went out on a date with, and she said, um, you know, you're a great friend. You should definitely stay in touch, but uh, I am definitely Jewish enough for two, uh, which I thought was like, what a great example of internalized anti-Semitism, right? Um, 
But even apart from sort of like subjective internalized anti-Semitism, there is within the race world and Roman groups, there are subsets. So the last time I checked, the gap in objective income and wealth between light-skinned African-American and dark-skinned Black people is as great as the gap between whites and Blacks generally. So all of this suggests that there's uh, you know, some sort of problematics as the parties. And the last bit on the author, I will say that I tried to teach something uh, successfully once talking about George Floyd's race, how it related to some of the problems of uh, saying that everything as difficult conversation says is about uh, contributions rather than uh, victims and offenders, at least in some circumstances. One year, students thought it was very progressive, and I had this image of George Floyd and feeling this wasn't too and the next year, a student who was not themselves black said that I should not have shown this image or talked about this because I myself am not black. So I'm just kind of curious. Like, yeah. well, let me start with that true. first, my role as mm -hmm. author. Um, being both Sharon and I are white, Isabel is African American. Um, and Sharon and I felt that. Um, that white supremacy is a problem for everyone, but it's a problem for white people. And so that there's there's certainly a place for white people to be talking about white supremacy, which we see as very different than saying, here's the formula for the way mediators should be dealing with African-American parties, because we can have views on that, but that's not our situation. We can't. I mean, so some of this is not a matter of academic research, right? It's a matter of who we are. So, you know, we've had a couple of people push back. We've had a presentation declined because they thought they weren't ready for this. Um, but we, we've been lucky, I think, in terms of people saying, wow, this is interesting. Um, and we hope that partly our restraint and how far we push our expertise has been part of that. Um, now, your first part of your question was big, right? Um, can you can you give it to me again in one sentence? Claire? Oh, uh, I think it might have been. Uh, oh gosh, like matching could be seemingly as great but actually maybe matching isn't so great for a variety of reasons. One, it's hard to know what is the relevant category to match. Is it light skin versus dark skin? And then the other is there could be internalized racism or whatever the form of bias might be. And then false consciousness. People, you're correct, feel better, but they actually could be giving up uh, real opportunities. Um, right, is it, a, is, it a, is it yet another form of manipulation? Might be correct, right, the way that people will hire women to defend uh, well, I, and you mentioned the research that comes out of the New Mexico Metro Courts, and I will say that's a very complicated and somewhat controversial set of research. The, the memory of it that stuck with me is that, they, I mean, because they were measuring claimants, they were measuring what people were claiming versus what they got. And they had all kinds of different variables with the races of the parties and the race of the mediator. And comparing um, white claimants to African American claimants, well, a lot of the minorities there were um, Hispanic, Latinos. Um, they did find that when there was a white mediator, there were categories of the, the people of color who did not do as well. Um, so was it related to them being white? Was it, you know, it, 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 there were a lot of elements. I, I've heard statisticians criticize it. So let's just say it's not fresh enough in my mind right now to fully engage with you. There, there is also work there. So there's some work out of Maryland um, showing that where, and it's not necessarily a match situation, but where someone does share the race. And again, we're speaking big categories here. I take your point that, especially when you think about intersectionality, race is not the only relevant thing, but it's a huge thing in our society, right? Um, when, when, some, when a party did have a mediator who was their own race, they felt better about their effectiveness, their, their self-efficacy. Now there were, and I'm 
not sure I can remember that, again because I don't want to misstate any of these things. There were also studies that where there wasn't someone of their race, and there were I I, I don't want to say. Let's just uh, let's just say there's a little bit of research out there. But as with all this kind of research, we need a whole lot more. We need more than one study in Maryland that looks at co-mediation. I do think that even without which you might think of as race matching. And I think there are some problems with that, right? Uh, you know, if you've seen a divorcing couple and a male and a female mediator, well, the husband may kind of latch on to the male mediator as his mediator and the wife latches on to the female mediator as her mediator, you know, so you got to avoid dynamics like that. But it can, you know, in addition to the things I mentioned, it can also model a cooperative effort Right, and in that way, it's very useful. So I think there are advantages to it, even without the race matching. And I think we need a lot more research to to really sort out, because as the statistics, you know, you're doing a natural experiment, right? You're not having, you don't have a control group. Um, you're doing a natural experiment with who shows up for mediation and who their mediator is, and so this the statistical strength is can be weak. How about other folks here? Yes, sir. Do you have a question? You can go, go ahead. All right. Then, um, then we'll come to the. So um, I guess I've, I have a, have a problem with assuming that some norms are white norms. For example, men are conditioned, I think, especially in the classroom context, to interrupt and talk over women. <laughs> um, I, I don't see how a mediator could possibly apply a rule by saying, okay, you, based on you know, your, your status, you get to, should, you know, I'll give you a pass on it, interrupting the other, other party. And and not a, and not apply the not apply that even handedly. Yeah, I I are you done? Yeah. I think that's a good question. I'm thinking you want to say a little more than that, but maybe not. Well, I don't, in your face. <laughs> um, I mean, I've also read John McWhorter's book Woke Racism, and I realize it may be a controversial uh, concept in here, but. You know, I, essentially, I think his argument is that anti-racism, uh, in some ways, is pa uh, patronizing or condescending uh, to African Americans uh, by assuming that you know th th norms like, let's say, punctuality shouldn't apply to black people. Um, I have yeah, Indian we, we, relatives, we, perhaps that's a better example in terms of stereotypes yeah. and punctuality. Uh, but yeah, so these are difficult questions. And I think part of it is another word that we throw around is self-determination, because I agree with you. You don't wanna have one party feeling free to interrupt the other um, and then not allow the second party to interrupt the first party. So, but, and what happens if one of them really thinks that respect involves interrupting and fully voicing their opinion and the other things that respect involves not being interrupted? I don't think there's easy answers here, but I think it could even help just to talk that out. How can you two best communicate? And you're telling me that your way of communicating involves a loud voice and interrupting and you're telling me that's a lack of respect. So let me just quick, quickly make an announcement. Those of you who are joining us via Zoom, uh, we can't see the comments. So if you'd like to raise a question, please just raise your Zoom hand so that we can call on you. Uh, we do actually have one question in the comment that um, Karen just uh, brought to my attention. So let me just read that one out okay. because we can't see them on the main screen. Uh, so Chitra Narayan from uh, Chennai has uh, said, thank you. The point you make that there is politics slash status quo masquerading 
neutrality is so important. The question is, uh, how do we take account as we proceed of majoritarian slash racial slash casteist uh, positions reasserting themselves in mediation on the basis that the mediator should be concerned with these activities? How do we take account as we proceed of majoritarian racist or casteist positions reasserting themselves in mediation on the basis that the mediator should be concerned with these ideas of equity. Well, to me, equity means that, um, that while we think of equality as treating people the same, so we would um, maybe not intervene because we're, we're being careful not to intervene. Equity can justify some different treatments when the situation is different, when the, when the, when the people are in different situations. And so I think that, I, I think equity is a, is a way to, to conceptualize the idea that that there, that there may still be limits on how the way in which a mediator can intervene, but that perhaps they can intervene more when the situations are different among the two people. And so the anti-majoritarian, you know, when the majority person is in the state, that they could intervene in some way to support. And, you know, and here's where I think this has to be determined. What extent do we, do we destroy mediation if we allow this kind of intervention, but I think we have to think about it. Um, I forget the other categories that the questioner mentioned, but I appreciate your um, participation from the other side of the world. Thank you very much. Um, Questions from the live audience? All right. Well, so I, I want to pick up on something that I've, I've actually heard a couple times <clears throat> with the idea of. Uh, anti-racist work, anti-racism work occurring or not occurring in mediations and whether it's the appropriate place to do it in mediations. And I guess I wonder <clears throat> if it isn't, if it shouldn't happen in a mediation setting where open communication and the freedom to kind of dialogue with each other in a culture of sort of some, some uh, measure of respect, whether that looks different from our party's perspective or not, uh, if it isn't supposed to happen there, I don't know where it could happen. And so I guess I want to kind of ask you how you see that working. If it if it doesn't take place in that kind of environment, where could it take place? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I think community dialogue is a place where it could take place without the constraints of mediation. We don't think of community dialogue as led by a facilitator. Um, and, but they're not the same kind of ground rules about neutrality. And there's not, at this point anyway, not the same um, development of sort of formal ways that we, that we tend to automatically approach mediation that could be I mean, like the forward thinking and the, the ground rules that we just, we don't want to throw everything out, but that we need to be thinking about, is this appropriate for this situation? So I do think that community dialogue is, is one good, I mean, but of course we raise these issues with the hope that mediation can be effective. Um, I also think just person to person, it can be effective, but that doesn't always get you to the same structural uh, results that you could get out of some mediations. Now, so, you had a question earlier. I know we're, go ahead. So I, I just wanted to kind of ask it, uh, about the mediation conference idea. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, kind of wondering if, if that means more starting in caucus before the opening part to get check in or, or like on a different day where it it might inform the general plan. Okay, so he's asking about pre-mediation conferences. I think it could work either way. Um, there's been more attention paid to the idea of pre-mediation conferences 
mediators have used them to some extent for sort of practical things and procedures and uh, talking to the attorneys, but I think that people's ideas of what those could be are expanding. And one possibility could be to get into the substance. Now, I would say the danger is you don't want this to turn into a substitute for the joint session if you have those, right? Because there's a, well, there's a point in the person telling their story to, for the first time to the mediator and the other side hears it now, right? So you would want to say, okay, I'd love to hear your story now, but you need to say it again later. I, I think you wouldn't want to short circuit that process. I also think you could think of it as an initial caucus in a, in say a court mediation where you don't have the luxury of time to spend separately with each party ahead of time and then a break and then you have the mediation session. Um, I think it's, I think it could be adapted. I think it could even be done not necessarily by the mediator, but maybe by a clerk who might then be able to pick the best mediator. Cool. Okay, screen. There we go. All right. Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> Sandra, go ahead with your question. You're muted right now. Not getting anything from Sandra. So what set well Sandra Carroll figures out how to unmute herself. She's not a space for anti-racist work. What do you think that signifies regarding American ideals about justice? I think it's bad news. Um, I mean, I guess one could flip that around and uh, you know say ask about. Um, I mean, we're asking how to make it a better place, I guess, and, and you are flipping it around. Um, I mean, I think we have to recognize that the current political realities are, are very fractured. Uh, and I think mediation is one except, you know, a place that's an exception to that. So I do think it's important that we find some way for mediation to be, um, you know, overtly anti-racist as well as dealing as it does now with things that may not have a racist theme or a racist thing. I think there's a lot of racist issues that people carry underneath that don't necessarily surface. Now again go back does the does the individual want to surface? It should be up to them. It shouldn't be a I'm a mediator who wants to be anti-racist, and so you're going to talk about this. I mean, that would be the worst possible thing, right? We have to go. We have to embed this in our other values of autonomy and self-determination. Um, and how do we understand what the person is comfortable with? That's where I think we have to really listen and really, really learn empathy. If I were starting a training program now for mediation, I think I'd start with empathy, which uh, is not, you know, not an easy thing, but I think we can learn to do better at it. Other questions? Sandra, did you did you have a question? So if, if I may ask a question while Sandra is working that out. Um, so, you know, as I was reading your paper, it occurred to me, what, what is mediation really? Right? That you might be thinking about a process that's very really different. Because <clears throat> as you were talking about, you know, situations where the mediator tone polices, for example, there were some vignettes in the paper where it really felt like the mediator was talking down at the parties, you know, like, don't be angry or be respectful, don't interrupt, um, which really evokes for me a more of a kind of community mediation format where there are parties who are basically unrepresented and a mediator who's doing all this largely in joint session. Um, when you look at kind of more commercial and employment mediations that are lawyer driven, right? At least in California, the joint session is pretty much dead. Uh, and so I, as a mediator, almost never find myself in the situation of partly because when the lawyers are involved, 
A, you don't need to do that. And even if you did do that, it would be very disrespectful to a lawyer to say that. That almost never arises for me. And so for me, I guess the question is, what's the role of the lawyer in all of this? Um, in some ways, if you have this kind of community-based model, to do a lot of this anti-racist work. But if you have an employment dispute where, for example, the minority employee is represented by a, law by a lawyer, a law that lawyer is doing a lot of that anti-racist work too, right? And so can you talk a little bit more about that and how that kind of affects your argument? Uh, so I, I do think that a lot of this has the feel of joint session. Um, and I think that it varies in different parts of the country. I, I, I mean, yes, um, joint sessions are probably far less now than they used to be. Um, but I think that the kind of the kind of conflict that we're thinking of is one that's between the individuals, and the lawyers may be able to help with the legal aspects of it, but that in terms of um, the landlord and the tenant, where the tenant feels disrespected, um, you know, either you decide that's off the table or you need them both there and they do need at some point, either through you or directly to each other to be talking to each other. So, but I think there is relevance for these ideas because I think that, you know, certainly there are a lot of um, employment disputes that involve discrimination of all kinds, not just racial. And um, it seems to me that that here's a place where we would not just want to be training mediators, but training the lawyers who are representing clients in mediation to also be more sensitive to what their client really wants. Okay, so uh, not just the lawyer assuming that what they want is the big money or the reinstatement, but that maybe, and I don't mean a formal apology always, but maybe what they want is a reconnection with that doctor who had a bad outcome from a surgery, or maybe they, they actually want some kind of relationship with this other person, um, and that that could be an element of it. So I think that the, that you know, we train mediators, I think we also ought to be training lawyers to think about disputes between people, would be they corporations, because corporations are at the bottom humans, right? I think that we ought to be training lawyers as well, so that it's not all on the mediators, right? Or so that it, in a sense that, and maybe the pre, the pre mediation conference should be with them as well. How do you see this? Are you willing to go with your client into this realm um, where it's not explicit. I mean, obviously some mediations are directly about some kind of discrimination claim and there it's front and center, um, but it could also just be underlined. So I, I think that um, we shouldn't stop with mediators. We should, um, you know, I, I see the, the hat out there that says, um, interests and positions. Um, I think we need more lawyers who don't just say those words, but really understand that they're, they're and, and, so let me take a little divergence here. In this world where we have chat, GPT, and, and artificial intelligence, who's going to employ, what are lawyers have, going to have to offer as a human being? What are mediators going to have to offer as a human being? It seems to me that at least so far, we're better than the machines at relationships. Now, that may not last forever, but I do think that lawyers are going to need to start thinking about more than just filling out the paperwork and selecting the claim that's going to get the most money for their client. They, they need to spend more time with that person and really exert empathy themselves. Um, you know, the, the lawyer point is so interesting that it relates to the remedies as well and the anti-racism because uh, in many instances, you brought up apology, but another example is uh, one could seek, and I think as I understand it, um, from a lot of what I've read, a lot of critical race theory is based on um, 
systemic change or systemic obstacles that require systemic change. So it's interesting the lawyers involved in the case, depending on whether it's a fee shifting statute or a contingency fee statute, the lawyer would not be indifferent to change. Meaning that if a lawyer is operating on a contingency fee, they're going to want to have huge money damages from which they're going to get stuff, and they're not going to want systemic change. So let's suppose there's a professor at a law school named just randomly Patricia Williams. And Patricia, Patricia Williams says, hey, I wasn't hired at Stanford in 1991 because I got bad student evaluations. But those student evaluations, the way that they were done, is systematically racist. A contingency fee lawyer would think, OK, that's true. Let's ask for a lot of money damages. Whereas if it were a case where there was fee shifting, the person might be open-minded about, oh, well, maybe she doesn't really want the money. She has this beautiful townhouse in this hypothetical in um, in hypothetical to Westfield, which if I remember correctly. Uh, but she might really want systemic change, changing the way the evaluations work, right? So I think that might be an interesting angle for the paper is to think about how lawyer representation might affect the anti-racism in this particular way dealing with the remedies. And there may be other ones as, as well. Well, and, and maybe um, not all lawyers are completely driven by how big their fee is. I mean, now I'm really moving into naive land. But, <laughs> uh, I do think there are lawyers out there who, who want to serve their clients. And, um, and so, so having a larger picture of what that means is what I'm saying. Yeah. But maybe we could change some of the incentives um, with more fee shifting. And so I'm mindful of the fact that we've gone a little bit over. But thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to all of you on Zoom who I couldn't see.